Okay, so I'm uh, Max, Max Bigri uh, from uh, Hyperspace, Israel CTO and co-founder. I will not talk about uh, AI, no models, nothing like this. Um, <clears throat> I will talk about something that uh, probably all of you faces, at least the data engineers and maybe the scientists uh, um, of you. Um, assuming you have a business logic to implement that you know the recipe how to implement this business logic and you have to implement it in real time. So you have the, the, the recipe and you implement it in a software and you see here the, the x-axis is the time and you see the, the red region is the real time region. You implement it and you see that the Latency of this implementation is far beyond the real-time experience. <clears throat> so you have in mind the accurate solution and the result, the experience is very bad. So you have to compromise and you start to, to modify the, the, the implementation and the, you bring up a practical solution with apparently high error rate and low conversion. But this is life, you have to keep the experience, okay? So this is a problem that uh, probably most of you have. <clears throat> so let's take a, a, a look on this problem from uh, um, some higher perspective, okay? Let's this, uh, talk about software uh, workloads inefficiency. Um, there are workloads uh, uh, classes or categories um, and I pointed here uh, three classes, inference class, okay, in the, the, the spare in the blue, graph traver traversal, and document similarity. The x-axis is the uh, workload inefficiency, while the, the, uh, the wall on the right is the algorithmic wall. So what does, what does it mean, the, the, the algorithmic wall, okay? The, again, the, the spare in blue is the current uh, uh, state of this workload implemented in software, okay? Let's take a, a graph traversal algorithm, typical graph traversal algorithm, for instance, Dijkstra, which calculates the, the shortest path between uh, uh, two points, okay? We have a pseudocode of this algorithm, and you uh, and we put on a piece of, and we put on a piece of paper the number of memory accesses, the number of multiplication, the number of uh, uh, all the operation, and we summarize this, and we get a number. Okay, for each calculation, we get a number. Now, the, of course, this algorithm is implemented in software. We measure the number that we 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 have it in, in real time and the results are totally different. So we ask, what is the problem with this? Why, why is that? <clears throat> so we understand that uh, uh, in software, there is a lot of inefficiency, okay? The, <clears throat> the, there are cache hierarchies and there are many uh, 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 semantics in software that uh, uh, prevent from the workload to be on the algorithmic wall, okay? So um, the graph traversal is the, is the problem class that has the most uh, uh, opportunity for acceleration, okay? It is far, probably 1,000 uh, X from the algorithmic wall, okay? Implemented in, in software. The inference, which is uh, uh, implemented by, uh, uh, mostly uh, uh, dominated by uh, matrix uh, multiplication, <coughs> If it was implemented in software, it was near the, again, the thousand X. And now we understand that uh, they are implemented on uh, GPU and we, uh, and it is get closer to the wall, okay? So how you take a workload and uh, get it closer to the wall? You implement it, <laughs> you, you design a new device, okay? A domain specific computer architecture, which is a GPU, okay, that is specialized for this workload. And this takes the, the, uh, the workload from this um, blue sphere to the, uh, toward the wall to the orange sphere, uh, to the orange sphere, okay? This is almost touch the wall, okay, uh, with the acceleration potential up to uh, 10x, okay? The graph traversal, as I said, it's the, the, <coughs> 
the class, the problem class with the most uh, uh, potential for acceleration. And the document similarity or part of the functionality of Elasticsearch, okay, stays at the 100X, okay? The Y axis is the design effort. What is the effort to design a domain specific architecture that implement this workload? So lowest effort is kind of document similarity, higher graph traversal and higher inferences, okay? So this is the wall. Okay, so what we, okay. So we took the elastic part, the document similarity, and uh, write a pseudocode of this workload and uh, started to put blocks on a piece of paper. And those blocks are part of, of chips, okay? Part of silicon chips, okay? This is the discipline of computer engineering and the electrical engineering. And uh, we implemented all this on a special breed of hardware that exists in the, in the cloud, okay? It is what is called FPGA-based. And the result of this uh, uh, um, implementation is uh, 20 to 50x faster than the software implementation of uh, Elasticsearch, okay? So to illustrate what we did, okay? So on the left, we have a CPU that is in the cloud and Elasticsearch in software run on it, okay? The other side of the comparison is uh, our architecture that was implemented on a special breed of hardware in the cloud and the result is 100x faster, okay? So now, so now, our implementation, we took the theoretical solution and implemented it in hardware and it fall inside the real-time region without any compromise, okay? So we don't have the, the error rate and the low conversion and you have the accurate solution uh, on a chip inside in the cloud, okay? Without any compromise and with still the flexibility of software, okay? This is what I had to show. I hope you understood something. Thank you very much, Max. Hello, can you hear me? Fantastic, so we're gonna move quickly on with Artem on is LLM the right tool? Artem. Uh, yeah, I'm from TomTom, Tom, uh, uh, Artem. Um, so we are live uh, in exciting times of large language models. And we have a lot of opportunities uh, opened because of this, but actually is LLM the right tool? Um, let's uh, see an example, which we uh, found during an analysis of our failed session. So in Brazil, it appears that there are streets which are which looks like this, Rua Mil Eduzentos Trinta Quatro. Correct me if I pronounce it incorrectly. <laughs> it means street 1,234. Yeah, so, but because I'm, I'm working for search, yeah, how people search for this street? Of course, uh, they do not type all this stuff. They type Rua. One, two, three, four, that's all. So we have LLM, we can use it, right? So for if, if we use GPT-4, for example, I can use this prompt, translate the Portuguese cardinal number in the street name into digits for Rua Mil Eduzentos at Rinde Quatro. And I get a perfect result. Yeah, we can use it, right? And actually, if you look at our uh, product plan, TomTomCon for navigation, if you type it, you can find those results. Wait, um, 
but did we use GPT-4? Let's look at the cost. It says that for the prompt, I need to pay three cents per 1,000 or six cents per 1,000 of sample tokens. So um, let's calculate. I have about 30 tokens in my prompt. Mm, so let's assume we have about 100 million documents. If I calculate it correctly, uh, my company needs to pay about $200,000 just per one indexing. Crazy. Um, let's make a step back. Do, 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 we, do we really need LLM? Well, we actually can just transform mil to one, Duzentos to two, Trinta to three, Quattro to four. That's all. And do we have uh, some classical algorithm for this? Sure. We have finite state transducers. So it's like a regular expressions, uh, which we know, but it transforms. So it matches and then transforms. So if you just use a finite state transducer, your problem is solved in milliseconds, nanoseconds, because it's very fast. So be mindful about the cost, about your carbon footprint, even if you have this money to pay for GPT-4, and of course, because of this, the future of the next generations. That's all. Um, if you would like to look at our fuzzy search API, you can go to this address. If you would like to see how I used fine state reducers in my side project for Russian language, but for a different problem, you can look at those slides as well. <clears throat> Fantastic. This is a message I don't think is said enough about the, the sheer, not just the dollar cost of all this clever AI stuff, but there are other costs we should really bear in mind. Thank you so much, Avatem. So next up, we have a man you may have seen a few times already this week, uh, Mr. Daniel Wrigley. So the number of slides I have prepared for today is zero. I'm going to show you a tool that I haven't written, but my boss. And also Lucian will, let's say, um, share his view on decompounding, which I'm going to show you now later on and no i don't have any idea why i'm going through this pain on a thursday afternoon so what i want to show you is decompounding with quirky who of you knows quirky who has it in production who is using decompounding with quirky one two okay who knows what decompounding is more hands. Okay, so what Quirky is, Quirky is, in a nutshell, a query rewriting engine for Solar, for Elasticsearch, for OpenSearch. And what I'm going to show you now is how you can use it to actually approach the problem of solving decompounding. And we can do so with the so-called word break rewriter. And it actually does what it says. It breaks words, um, but not like they are broken afterwards, but they you can split, it can split words. And what we are trying to solve is actually we want to find compound nouns, no matter if we write them together, wall mount, for example, one word, or wall mount as two words. And what I have hopefully prepared in a state that it's showable is a minimal example here in Elasticsearch, but you can actually do that also in OpenSearch and in Solar. So it's pretty easy to, let's say, get everything up and running. Everything you need is Elasticsearch and the Quirky plugin installed. So I have Elasticsearch, I have the Quirky plugin installed. And now I'm just creating a word break rewriter in the first thing here. So this is just a JSON that I'm pasting. And all that is in there is I'm using a specific class, which is the quirky uh, word break rewriter. I'm defining a so-called dictionary field. So this is basically the lookup field for quirky to 
find out where do I have potential um, breaks or uh, units of my compound noun. And then uh, a couple of additional settings here that I won't go into detail, except one. Um, the German morphology is implemented here. So German is really a great language to work in for search because it just has so many challenges and you won't be out of a job uh, forever. Um, and with tools like these, it can actually help yourself um, as a, a search engineer or search consultant. And in this case, German morphology just means that there are a couple of rules in German how compounds are built. So um, if you have a word like Kapitän, Captain, and Mütze, hat, you just can't say Kapitän, Mütze. You need an S in between Kapitän's Mütze. I don't know why, but that's the case. But there are other compound nouns where you don't need the S in between. So there are funny rules that, um, let's say, are, are easily to, let's say, use if you have a tool like Quirky. And what I'm now going to do is I'm going to index three documents, uh, two documents, sorry. So one is the document that only has a name wall mount one word and the second one wall mount two words. And next I'm going to search for wall mount one word. And I'm going to decrease this a little now. If we have a look at the results, we only see one of the two documents that I have indexed. So the one where wall mount is written as a compound noun. So this is now basically the problem that we want to solve. We also want to find wall mount two words. Now, on the other hand, if I search for wall mount two words, like in this query, we only find the other document. So it's either or, but now in German, at least, we can also have a third case. We can say something like mount for wall. So this is a little constructed in English now, but food for dog, dog food, something like that. I guess you can imagine how that works. Um, if we search for the third case, again, we are only finding one out of the two documents and not the compound word in this case. So now enter quirky. We now have the quirky word break rewriter in this query. So this is now line 61 that you need to take care of. All that we are doing now is we are now using the quirky, uh, let's say, search operation in Elasticsearch. We are still searching in the same field, but we are now using the rewriter. And if I'm searching for wall mount one word now, I'm actually retrieving both results because quirky now looks up in the dictionary field and says, hey, I can split wall mount into two words, but I can also search for wall mount as the compound noun. So now I'm retrieving both documents. Now, if we search for wall mount two words, we want to have the same result and voila, we are seeing the same result. So we can also compound, so build compound nouns when using quirky without really any um, additional configuration effort. And now last but not least, the mount for wall example. Again, one query, both results, although it's a very different query in this case now, but this is now what the quirky magic um, provides us with. So if you want to solve the compound problem in German or in very constructed English like here, Quirky is the tool to go for. It's open source. If you have any questions, ask Rene. He built it. Um, or ask me, of course. And uh, that's basically what I have prepared. And now I'm interested in Lushan's talk, not next, but um, in a couple of minutes, what he will show us when it comes to decompounding and his solution. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. OK, so we now have another Max. We have the maximum number of maxes. Yes. So ready for some math? Ma I won't use math. So uh, I like the talk of uh, eBay a lot. So thanks a lot to you, because you had some intuition about how vector embeddings uh, look like and how embedding spaces look like. And I very much like this. And I would like to build a little bit better intuition about embedding spaces. And uh, the question is, OK, which is harder, doing top k or doing top 1 in two-dimensional space? 
And first of all, forget about models here. We only think about the embedding space. So I only want to, you to think about vector spaces and how we reach this is completely irrelevant. Let's assume we have a perfect vector space. What can we achieve there? This is somehow what I want to explore. And um, when we uh, look at these nine products, let's say we have, uh, these are our products that we want to kind of search. And now my question is, which of these two query sets harder? On the left-hand side, you have red, blue, green, shoe, t-shirt, and pants. On the right-hand side, you have the nine queries that somehow very well fit to the uh, product that we have, but they are longer and compounded. So who believes the left-hand side is easier? Easier. Who believes the right-hand side is easier? In 2D. Okay, actually, the right-hand side is much easier in 2D because we can map every single query just exactly to the product and we're done then we can somehow, even if we have millions of different uh, queries and products, and they map exactly one-to-one, -one, we can easily do this in 2D. We don't need more space. But the right-hand side is much harder. So if we map pens here, we will always get, uh, we can try to rearrange things and things get better. But uh, in this, at least when we have this order, we get somehow shoes in the way or t-shirts. When we now change our vector space to move away the shoes and the t-shirts, the pens are nice. But now I get the problem. When I want to do blue, that doesn't work because blue, I would somehow want the blue t-shirts. And now you can try at home to rearrange things, you will not succeed. So because of combinatorial reasons, there will be no chance to make this nicer. I mean, for blue, you can change the vector space like this, but then you have a different vector space and you can't do pens anymore. And when you have a certain amount of categories and variations of these categories, you get into this problem. And this is unavoidable. And for me, the question is, okay, how many uh, categories and uh, variations of these categories can we fit into one space and how many queries can we fit into one space and I believe we can't fit too many into even if we have a uh, higher dimension we can't fit too many in there because we have a combinatorial problem here that very quickly also explodes on the problem complexity so yes our space gets bigger so every time we add a dimension to the space our solution space gets much bigger but every time we add a color our problem space also gets much bigger and um, I'm very uh, certain that we, for e-commerce, when we have queries where the results are sets and not just single uh, results, but sets, we have a big problem. Or when we don't have categories. So before we had the legal talk, uh, I like this as well a lot, uh, there we had kind of a classification. Classification is I have a query and all the results from one query are distinct to all the results of another query. That's nice. That works nice. We have, can distribute them in space and we can do this also with embeddings. First, embeddings are too big gun here, but we can do. But in the moment, this uh, result sets overlap, like we have here, um, we have a big problem. And this combinatory complexity that we have actually doesn't depend on the product uh, product facets, but on the queries we want to be able to solve and on the uh, how much these queries we want to solve overlap. So uh, I had a lot of talk with Rene, and he always says, okay, for long-term uh, queries, things work nicely. The reason is usually long-term queries uh, with vector search, they're long. They usually have just one or two products that fit, so we actually don't have a big overlap between these queries. And Or if we have an overlap, they completely overlap. And that's why they work there well. And uh, But if they have an, are not tiny and have quite some overlap, the different queries we want to solve, we, we can't solve this with embeddings. This is my, my takeaway, uh, home, uh, takeaway message. And... Um, just one embedding space will not work. Not going to happen. And that's news for vector search engines. But on the other hand, perhaps you can do use multiple embedding spaces and uh, blend them in via uh, RF or some other um, techniques like filtering. But uh, just one embedding space for e-commerce search will not work. And even the question, do we need billion scale? We had several talks about billion scale, at least for e-commerce. I'm very, very skeptical because uh, perhaps you can just chart the problem into different spaces and then we don't need to do the billion scale lookup. Most of these thoughts somehow developed over the past 36 hours. Uh, so I had this thought since quite some time, but some of the, the exact variations. So there might be quite some gaps and I'm happy to discuss if anybody has some input here. That's it. Thank you, Max. And Max wins the prize for fitting the, the most words into his five minutes. So thank you for that. <laughs> Fantastic information. Right. Brilliant. Okay. So next we have Marcos. Hi, everyone. So I'm Marcos Gabriel. I work for Delivery Europe <coughs> in the 20 years of experience. So we were having problems with spell correction. So we were using Elasticsearch spell corrector with the normal suggestors. 
and we were frequently getting uh, complaints from our clients. And uh, <clears throat> the problem was that Elasticsearch, the statistics over the documents that are indexed and users actually write the um, queries in a different language. So we decided to try something else that I have tried some years ago. So we pick the top queries uh, that are converting and we simply set it uh, inside a Lucene index. So the queries are set as keywords and then we have a simple count. So in order to now correct a query, we do it very simple. For the queries that the first instance call to Elasticsearch gives zero results, we search on this Lucene index. We do a simple fuzzy search to this Lucene index, to this field, and we retrieve the, the, the stop converting query. So in here, we have some of the examples that we have found. So using uh, Elasticsearch correction, we have uh, queries like over converting to other. So this is a query that you will never see a user do because it basically makes absolutely no sense. So doing this fuzzy query, we were able to find beer and actually we don't even care about the prefix. So in Elasticsearch, many of these solutions try to, to, to fix the, the prefix as being a very good matching, not in our case. So another query that we found was Agandazo, so I think everyone knows Agandaz, but those is actually an important word in Singapore. But having Agan uh, behind it, it makes no sense uh, as a correction. One that I have to be honestly, never understood why, but Coca X Cola in Singapore somehow was being converted to Coco Colon. <laughs> Don't ask me <laughs> how this was created. Yeah, and basically simple fuzzy search clearly gives you Coca-Cola. And I think for the for the German persons, they also like this compounding, compounding. So I scream since the query, we are doing it as being a keyword. When we try to do a fuzzy search on it, I scream is separated. So this actually works with the uh, compounding, compounding on German. And we, we got... Uh, Way less complaints nowadays. Yeah, basically this was the presentation. So if you want, you can catch me outside. Fantastic. Thank you, Marcos. Uh, by the way, one percent at least in conversions for wow. for delivery. Excellent. Thank you. Well done. Okay, so we've got the ever entertaining Mr. Roman uh, Gramenikov, who is going to. Tell us about the horrors of relevance tuning. Hi, my name is Raman, and today we're going to talk about uh, the, the inability to do relevance tuning in the ages of semantic search. And as a search practitioner, I multiple times have observed how, how usually semantic search pilots fail. So you take something from hugging face, you go it through the sentence transformers, put it into your magical vector search database, which is chosen usually by like number of salesperson attacking you on LinkedIn. And then you observe the search results and it's like, okay, this is not a synthetic query, it's milk with mini LM over ESCI data set. And okay, three books about milk, got uh, uh, milk uh, creme and like something cleansing milk, actual milk at the end and the milk poster. So which is not really matching your understanding and what should be relevant because you have the intent because you know this intent, your customers don't also know the intent, but Mini LM doesn't know the intent because it tries to maximize recall to pull all the possible combinations into the top just to match something. Maybe you chose the wrong vector database. You go to another vector database and another vector database, and it's still kind of the same because the problem is not in the vector database, but the problem is the actual embeddings. And that's kind of not the database, but embeddings matter. But uh, kind of installing vector database is a uh, pleasant task, but actually making it work in your particular business use case is not as pleasant as it can be. 
uh, there was a slide about commoditizing like uh, the cycles of the industry and like vector search went through the cycle from the idea to maturity and products solving a particular use case. And I, but uh, from my perspective as a search practitioner, actually optimizing recall is not a business problem. That's why I want to optimize the actual conversion and money getting out of the search. Uh, what can we do? And I, my feeling is that it's uh, still semantic search, not the vector search, but the actual semantic search is just in, at the beginning of the cycle. And uh, I want to, to have like, to have a relevancy signals like I want to say to the model that actually milk is relevant to the pasteurized milk and not a goat milk soap. I want to have some sort of a typo tolerance. If you try to plug typos in mini LM, you'll see it just falls into pieces and uh, actually solve the problem where you should stop. And maybe sometimes it's better to say that you have no results than show something. And uh, like an autocomplete, which is still unsolved thing, even for semantic search. And that's kind of where we're here right now. And I wanted to showcase you a thing, how I sold, how, how I spent my vacation, what happens with a search engineer when you have unlimited supply of uh, Perol Spritz. Um, so it's some sort of a research type of a search engine, which I'm doing at my free time, which is based on Lucene. So you get some facets filters for free and you don't need to reinvent your vector index from scratch like fun TV guys doing. It's uh, taking a lot of tech inspiration from the industry like segment replication, which can allow you to like do auto scaling in Kubernetes without any problems. And it's still like text in, text out. There is no special hole to put embeddings in because it doesn't take embeddings, it works with text. And the main idea of this project is the, the ability to, intro, to take relevant signals into your embedding model. So it's not just the same search results as everyone, but just the ability to fine tune the model on your data. If, in case if you have query and relevant document pairs, it can be taken from explicit judgments if you have lab human labelers saying what is relevant, or it can be taken from implicit judgments, like from conversion, from clickstream, but still you generate hard negatives, fine tune a custom model, and things usually become better. There was a talk about fine tuning on a low amount of uh, examples, like a good showcase that it actually works. Um, so, and a couple of cool things that like a semantic autocomplete, because if you have your query as a document and the prefix of this query with typos as a uh, query and fine tune a model which is uh, can deal with prefixes and typos, then you can have some sort of a semantic autocomplete which will always match something which is either lexicographically close to or semantically close to the like golden query data set you have. So it's on, on hugging face, just a couple of experiments, but it seems to work quite well. And the, actually the cutoff problem. So if you have document query pairs, you can either globally find like the number, the position, the cutoff where there are no more relevant product items are appearing because there are no more there. Or you can train a model to predict it for a specific query like uh, suggested uh, on the previous day. So that's it. There is on a GitHub, nothing works. I'm the only person who knows how to run this thing, but there are actually Docker snapshots and uh, there are no docs as usually, but it's kind of a good readme with example. So you can in theory run it. And uh, the last but not the least, uh, actually, if you do any fine tuning, you need GPU. So that's it. Thank you. Good okay. man. Thank you. Lucian Precap. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so following the... Uh... Yesterday's talk about um, um, about uh, Apache Lucene and uh, how to handle different aspects of uh, uh, different languages. So somebody so asked about uh, the compound words and uh, suggested that uh, we do uh, an update on that. So yeah, thanks, uh, uh, Sven. I think it was it was Sven that suggested that. Uh, so yeah, uh, Quarky is definitely a great solution for that, uh, and I'm gonna show kind of the same thing, and also the internals. So I think that if you look at the um, Quarky source code, we, you might find maybe the same techniques. Uh, so what we are trying to achieve, we are trying to like search for words that are uh, like uh, um, concatenated together and still find results where the words were not. Uh, con 
uh, concatenated and vice versa. Okay, so the, the technique that uh, we put in place, it's, um, it's based on uh, query writing also, but yeah, we just do it in case of zero results. So I think Quirky's approach is it's a little bit better because you might have results and still want to search for the for the separate uh, uh, spelling. So uh, we you need we ha actually need three things in order to to do this. Um, the first one is to have a dictionary, okay, for auto completion. So uh, if uh, something like this works, you know, you have this dictionary of keywords and key phrases uh that that you that you have so this one is uh like taken from the products themselves and uh these keywords actually are not labels or 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 stuff like that you have to like calculate them so this is the first step high step how to calculate these keywords here and once you have these keywords uh then you can simply do something like this um, so index so index these keywords with ngram uh, like like this um, oh sorry um, uh, so index them with ngram like this which makes you uh, uh, which makes available things like this you search for the word in like uh, concatenated and you find it uh, in the non-concatenated uh, form like uh, like this one so you see you have results here and the results are non-concatenated and vice versa you can also like I, I i'm putting here more words that are not not at all like the real spelling uh, and it still works so i still find the 38 products that are written like this okay so you you have seen here the a spelling that has nothing to do with it. So it's not dictionary, it's simply ngram. Okay. And yeah, to get into the details, so this first step is the is very important. And uh, how we do that, you actually can see all the details in this talk here at MySys. Um, and the idea is that you take uh, the data from, from your, your documents that you're indexing in the, in the search engine, these data can be structured or un unstructured. The idea is to extract from this the keywords that you will put in the keywords index. And the technique is using shingles. So the shingles are like windows that you uh, slide over the text. So for example, a shingle of two words here will give you a community, community search, search engine, etc. A shingle of three will give you this. And you just have to handle stop words and uh, and uh, some other details there. But with this one, you create keywords and combination of keywords uh, that you can then index in your keyword, keyword index. And in this case, yeah, you, you will have also the auto-completion that can, can work and suggest alternate spellings. And you have also the search that will work providing a uh, query rewriting as you have seen here. So query relaxing, and this one is the rewriting that made it possible. So that's it for, for this part. Uh, and now, yeah. Thank you, Lucien, quick round of applause for Lucien. And following Lucien, we now have Lucien. <laughs> okay, so uh, a completely different subject that has nothing to do with it, uh, just to, like talk about uh, LLMs a little bit and all that. Uh, so uh, yeah, we talked uh, during the conference, I don't know, with maybe with uh, Daniel or I don't know with who, about uh, like conversational search and yeah, what's going on and what can we do? Uh, and uh, yeah, I said, okay, I, I, I tried to bring up a demo. Uh, so the idea was to take the solar documentation and to add some conversational search on top of that. Uh, so yeah. We start from a um, standard search engine like like uh, like you know. So, for example, this one uh, index some data sources. I can show you also the data sources that we have in index. Uh, this is Open Search, uh, so Solar Dev uh, sources. So you have nothing special. You have the 
graph guide and some uh, wiki from from solar and uh yeah in total we have like uh, 300 uh, documents you see them here you can also have facets uh yeah a classical search engine yeah we find our friend eric few here of course it's solar and uh and so on uh yeah so facets you can see also the data sources that are here the archive is the pdfs that contain the uh, previous versions of solar as uh, as a so the documentation was in pdf and so on now you kind of start to see here already the the conversation that starts so the idea was instead of displaying results like this and facets okay why not displaying something like this the search engine will just say okay yeah so my search is not relevant here so let's let's do something like a language analyzers um So yeah, you have the the results here and the summarization. So it takes some time. I should have. Um, okay, so let's let's switch to this one. It's already there. So you search for language analyzer. So instead of just displaying uh, results like this and facets, uh, you can actually give the results in a different manner. Okay, so in this case, when I search for language analyzers in the solar documentation, I have things that are quite interesting. So I have the analysis screen that I showed yesterday, by the way, uh, you have uh, like document analysis in solar, you have um, uh, term vectors, you have schema designer. Uh, yeah, so, and you have this result here, I don't know why it's there, but yeah, it's phonetic, it's, it's connected anyhow. And then you have the, so yeah, this is the, the way to start the conversation. You know, you don't just give, and you also have the further information. So the the, the conversation is documented. You know, you just don't just give like uh, hallucinations and like things that ChatGPT might have invented. You actually have links and you can can see them like, just like you see the results of a, of a normal search engine. And then you can continue the conversation. So uh, hopefully my, previous skin finished i don't know this is open search okay so you continue the conversation like here and you can ask questions okay so for example i already prepared those here just to uh, gain some time how to handle the german language okay so let's uh, let's ask that uh, the funny thing about the uh, llms is that you never get the same answer uh, um the german language so this answer might be different from the previous one but anyhow so yeah the results is calculating so you have this one so it says that yeah you have the nor you have a um, um you can define in the schema in the solar schema you can you have a german analyzer you have a german normalizer filter and you can go, go even further you can say oh can you give me the code for that and the, the 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 funny thing here is that the code might not even exist in the documentation and this is the the advantage of generative ai because the documentation might uh, might give you examples for french or for, for english for something else and uh, the llm is capable of inventing the code that goes for german and it's it's quite it's quite i mean yeah it's it's correct to a certain extent and you have the code here uh yeah and then yeah you can ask questions for example german normalization normalization filter because you see it here what does it do it, it was advertised here okay so it says what does it do it replaces accents with their equivalent ascii form and so on okay i'm just gonna look at the example that was live here so you see that the response is slightly different but anyhow you can yeah, just continue the conversation. And that's it. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Lucian. And all our Lightning Talk speakers, thank you very much for standing up at such short notice and giving us a, a final set of talks.